never been there, so I don't know what that strip looks like. I've only seen pictures, I've seen it on videos, I've been in some movies and all of this. I see a lot, a lot of lights and it's the, the town that never like sleeps, right? It's always lit up. I think the, are the casinos open 24 seven? Yes, you all know that, I don't know that. But anyway, um, so here's, there's two friends and they're walking through I have to get this. They're walking through Caesar's Palace. And I understand that to be a really large casino and hotel, restaurants, shops, all those kinds of things, right? They are walking through Caesar's Palace. And they're walking together. They're talking together and mobs of people everywhere. And these two guys are walking together. All of a sudden, without warning, without any warning whatsoever, Friend number two throws up. I'm sorry, it throws up and there's stuff all over the floor. Lots and lots of people. Okay, friend number one had no idea that this was happening. He didn't know his friend was feeling ill. They were having a normal conversation. So they're walking, they're walking. He throws up, makes a great big mess on the floor. They weren't sure what to do, so they just kept on walking. All these people are around. They just keep on walking. And they get to a point uh, where friend number one says to friend number two, are you feeling okay? He says, well, I am now. <laughs> and they just keep on walking, but they decide that they should probably find a place to sit down. So they turn around and they start coming back this way and they get about 15 feet away from the scene of the crime, all this stuff on the floor. And they're thinking, I don't want to go back near that, but they don't have a choice. So they keep, they keep walking towards it. Just as they see the woman in front of them, slip, boom, down she goes, and she falls right into the mess. Her friends come along, and they help her get up, and she turns, and she says, what is this? Okay, the two friends decide, we're not going to say anything. We're just going to keep walking because it's only going to get worse from here. This is a big mess. They could do really nothing about, okay? Already happened. And before they even get to a restroom, friend number two throws up a few more times. So it's just a disaster from start. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Not exactly like that, probably, okay? But that sets the stage for... What I want to talk about today is following Jesus when you're in the middle of a mess. Now, that was a silly kind of a story. It happened, but it's a silly analogy of what this kind of messy world that we're, that we're in and how we, how we kind of walk through life. We're not looking for a mess. We're not looking for an obstacle. We're not looking, we're kind of wanting a peaceful kind of life. We're not looking for problems to rise up. They just seem to kind of find us, right? They find me. I'm thinking we're all in this together. We got enough mess going on in our life right now. And then before you know it, we've slipped, we've fallen. Things happen. And we're in the midst of this big, messy mess. And we wonder, what? is this? How did I get here? Why is this happening? Kind of stuff. Everybody's mess is different. Could be a mess in your family. Dynamics where bitterness is brooding and it's growing. And there's unforgiveness there. There's lots of arguing back and forth. It gets worse and worse and worse. And eventually it builds to a place where you kind of wonder, how did we get to this place? We're hardly talking anymore. And when we talk, we're yelling. We're finding the negatives instead of the positives that we used to love about one another. We don't even acknowledge each other anymore. How did we get to this place? Maybe your mess is in the area of addictions. And you know, when, whenever we say the word addictions, we immediately think drugs and alcohol. But I'm not talking about drugs and alcohol. That might be one or two of them. There are a whole bunch of other addictions. Do I hear an amen out there? There are a whole lot of addictions out there. 
And it started out fun. Started out being simple. Started out being just a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Pretty soon, it's controlling you. It's running your life. All you can think about is that thing, doing it the next time. It's a problem, and you don't know how to handle it anymore because it is handling you. It's consuming you. You wake up one morning, though, and you think, how did I get here? How did I allow this to happen? I can't seem to control this. Maybe it's an issue with your finances. You feel like no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you try to follow the Dave Ramsey uh, get on a budget kind of a thing, um, you still try to pull things together and you can't make it happen because you're always short of money. Constantly short of money. You think you got it figured out and you get two weeks into the month and you have no more money. And you ask yourself, how, how did I, how did we get in this mess? How did it get to this point? I can't breathe because the burden is so heavy. I used to feel that way. Years ago, one income, had a brand new baby, moved to a brand new town, had one car. I couldn't even go anywhere. And I felt just caged. How did we get into this mess? And where do we go from here? I can't figure it out. But I want to encourage us all today with what I believe are some of the most encouraging steps in the Bible that we can apply in the messes in our life. And believe it or not, we're going to turn to the book of Revelation. Revelation. Now, for some of us, that might scare us because we know very little about Revelation. A lot of people don't even like delving into the study of the book of Revelation. We had a, we had a really good Bible study on that. Dennis is not here. Um, I think about a year ago, we were in the book of, of Revelation. It is not a scary book. It does talk about future things. It does talk about that. But the book of Revelation is a book of hope, and it's a book of encouragement. I want you to know that it is a book of hope. It is a book of encouragement. It was written to the original Christians 2,000 years ago, and they were in a mess in their life. They were struggling at that time. You need, to, you need to picture this because Jesus had come. Jesus went to the cross. Jesus died. Jesus rose again from the dead. Jesus has already ascended up into heaven. And now, the Christians, those that believed in Jesus Christ, were being heavily persecuted. We don't know what persecution is like because our life is not on the line. Their life was on the line. If they said they believed in the way, Jesus, that was another way of saying that I'm a Christian. The way to heaven is through a person named Jesus. They were being persecuted. They were being arrested. They were being exiled to places. They were being imprisoned. They were being, being executed. That is persecution. Amen? That is persecution. We don't know what that's like. We're being stifled right now. We are not being persecuted like the first church was being persecuted. They were struggling. They were struggling in this new commitment they made to Jesus Christ. They were struggling in community. They were struggling in the world under Roman rule. They were struggling. And they needed some hope. And they had this big mess in their life. In fact, what, we're, what you need to know about them is what was going on culturally at the time. This persecution was against all Christians, the Christian community in general. They were being sought, hunted down. People were being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. Many of the early Christians were being killed. Uh, Paul who wrote most of the New Testament, was killed for his faith. Peter, who was an early church leader, upon this rock, Peter, I'm going to build the church. That's what Jesus said to him. He was killed for his faith. And John, the apostle, the, the disciple who wrote the book of Revelation, had the vision, wrote it down. He was exiled to an island called 
uh, the Isle of Patmos in the Mediterranean Sea. That is where he wrote this book. But he was exiled. He's the one that wrote John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You remember that one? He wrote that. So he's exiled to this island. So Christians are under this pressure of a really hard season in their life right now, culturally and historically. Because they were scattered, Jesus had already left this earth, and they were being heavily persecuted. They were wondering, who is in charge here? Who is our God? Where is he? Don't see him moving around right now. Our lives are on the line. Everything's spiraling out of control. So I have a question. Fast forward to today, right here, right now. You ever feel like things are spiraling out of control in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your finances, in your health, in everything? Boom, 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 boom. You name it. Put a name to it. Some of us are living in that right now. But we need to go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. And it begins by saying this. It identifies what this whole thing is. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant, John. So here we have, from that verse alone, we have Almighty God going to Jesus, who's going through an angel, going through his servant, John, to us. And he's bringing hope and he's bringing encouragement through the messes of our life. So Jesus cares enough to not only respond to the fears that we have in our messes, but he shows up in a very personal way. Because you see, everything about Jesus is personal. Did I spit on anybody there? I'm so sorry. Everything about Jesus is personal. He's not distant. He's not out of reach. He's right here. He's so close that when you invite him into your heart, he's in you. Can I get an amen on that? So Jesus cares enough to not only respond to the fear, but he shows up personally and he's giving this vision to John to reach us today. He speaks to us through a revelation that we obtain out of his word. You got a Bible? You need to be using it. I say it every single week because it's on you to grow. Every single person, it is on you to grow spiritually. The first thing that we see in the book of Revelation is that it's more than just being a scary book about the future. The word revelation means unveiling. So the book of Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus and the hope that he brings. It's an unveiling. Have you ever uh, seen, I've never been to like an art uh, uh, show or anything where they actually pull the cloth off the statue and they reveal the beautiful sculpture underneath. Well, that's what this is happening here. An unveiling of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Look for Jesus in every part of it as you read. If we look through the Gospels, the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. You're going to see the biographies of Jesus. They tell the story of Jesus' life. And we get one picture of Jesus and his humility. He is a very humble compassionate God. And we see him coming as a servant, washing his disciples' feet. He, he served people. He fed people. He healed people. He served. Now, we see a number, the number one emotion that's revealed through the scriptures and his life, and it shows throughout the New Testament and the Gospels, is this thing called compassion. We see this kind, compassionate, loving Jesus. That's who he is. That's who he's portrayed through the Gospels. 
But there's another side of Jesus that we're going to talk about. We also need to understand this because it is who he is. And that is the Jesus in his glory, in his glory. We see uh, uh, when he was on this earth, he just, he did all kinds of things. We just talked about that. But what we forget, I think, many times is the Jesus in his glory, the glory that Nobody can match. No other God can match. No other person can match. No other power can match. No government can match the glory of our Jesus. Amen. Amen to that. So in Revelation 1, we get a bigger picture of who Jesus is. He's humble. Yes. He's loving. Yes. He's a servant. Yes. But he is also a conquering warrior. Did you know that he's fighting for you? He has fought the fight for you. He paid the price for you. Amen. Amen. We see all of these attributes. Now in Revelation, they all come together. And here's what's so significant and so encouraging. We're talking what it, about what it means to follow Jesus Christ. And sometimes we just need to step back from the big mess that we're in that we can't we can't figure it out. We can't make it better. We can't even put step A, B, C together. And we need to step back from this mess that's consuming us. And we need to recalibrate our perception of who this Jesus is who's calling us to follow him. We have to take a really good look at who he is. Jesus. Jesus. He's not just the Savior. That's a biggie. But we need to reset. We need to recalibrate. And we need to really fix our eyes on Jesus Christ for who he is. If I were to boil down the whole book of Revelation, <clears throat> it would be this. Jesus wins. Jesus wins. He wins the race. He wins the fight. He wins, 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 wins. And through faith, we can share in his victory. I'm a victor. I am not a victim. You are a victor. You are not a victim. Revelation was written to Christians who were struggling. They were being slaughtered. They were being hurt. They were being bruised. They were being accused by a government and a people who wanted to suppress them. They wanted to wipe out Christianity. They needed encouragement. It is a book that actually meant to bring hope and encouragement in the middle of the struggles and the hurts and anything else that you're fighting in your life. So I want to give you three simple steps three simple things that we need to remember and apply to our life. It's going to recalibrate where we're at. We need to rethink, look at things from a different perspective, or the mess is going to get bigger in our life. So the very, very first one, number one, is recognize the real Jesus. We need to stop and recognize who Jesus is. Sometimes when I come to church on Sunday mornings, I'm thinking about the order of the service? Is everything going to be ready for this service? Is it like, like we have planned and, and everything and I need to stop and I need to reset and I need to rethink why I'm here. I'm here because I love Jesus. I'm worshiping not only myself, but I'm worshiping corporately with the family of God at 28th and S Street and everything else simply doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if we have a beautiful keyboard or not. I'm grateful for it, but I can worship without it. It doesn't matter if I sing every note correctly. It doesn't matter because God hears the song from my heart. It doesn't matter if I'm on key or not. I can worship him with my tithe. I can worship him with my offering. I can worship him in my prayer and my exaltation of him. And if I didn't have a voice box and I could not voice it, he would hear it anyway because it comes from here. All of this other stuff, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. 
So I have to recalibrate and I have to get out of my analytical thinking and my task list of things and simply remember that I've come to worship Jesus. Recognize the real Jesus. In our world, it's a challenge to recognize what's right and wrong. It's hard to recognize Jesus when we've got TV and movies that portray him in all sorts of kinds of ways. There's a lot of perceptions and misperceptions about who Jesus is. Amen? But Revelation gives us a bigger picture of who Jesus is and what it means when he calls us to follow him. He's calling us into this game of following the leader. I say the word game because that's what we connect follow the leader to. This isn't a game. This is a real life thing. And he's calling us to follow the leader. Uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 4 says, Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. From the sevenfold spirit before his throne and from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead and the ruler of all the kings of the world. Amen. Of all the titles that Jesus has in the Bible and all the names that we read that are given to Jesus in the Bible, this is the top one. He is the ruler of the kings of the world. Why is that significant in this follow the leader thing? Because it identifies who he is. In the culture back then at that time, they had a way different view of things than we do about kings. Today, we talk about a king and we think uh, a king is somebody who has power. Yes. Uh, They have some authority. Yes. Politically, they can sort of lean in a little bit and they can have some influence. But we really don't think about the king as being a dominant figure in every aspect of life like it was back then. In every area of society, every sector of society. In the ancient world, this is what a king had power over. He controlled all of the taxes. He controlled all of the financial regulations. He controlled all of the media. He controlled all of the press. He controlled all of the arts. He controlled all of the politics. He controlled all of the armies. He said when there was going to be a war, when there's going to be the end to the war. He controlled everything. Everything fell back on the king. The king had absolute power in that structure in the ancient world. Along comes Jesus. And he's introduced in Revelation as not just king. He's not even introduced as king with a little K, lowercase k. He's not even introduced as king with a capital K. Listen to this. He is introduced as the ruler of all kings. That it, that's what it means with the word He has sovereignty. He is sovereign. Nobody is above him. Nobody is above our God. Not any king, not any government, not anybody is above our God. That's who we are to follow. To a group of Christians who were frazzled and tired and worn out and wondering in the middle of their mess, God, where are you? I want you to think about your own mess right now. God, where are you? Revelation opens up with this declaration. Saint Jesus saying, I'm here. I'm still moving. I'm still working. I am the ruler of all the kings. Period. We need to recalibrate. We need to remember who this, who this God is that's calling us to follow him. And sometimes I think we, that goes to the back burner because our mess comes up in front of us. Our crises comes up in front of us. And all we can focus on is the junk that's right flying around. I kind of think about this as being, uh, now I come from the Midwest. We have a lot of tornadoes in the Midwest. Y'all saw the movie um, uh, Wizard of Oz. 
okay? She's caught up in this tornado. The house is swirling. Everything's swirling around. Junk swirls inside a tornado. The winds are so strong. It picks up cars. It picks up everything. And it's all swirling around. You will most likely be killed by the flying debris than anything else in a tornado. That's why you seek shelter in the basements. And I see that sometimes we are living in this this cyclone of stuff flying around us. And this stuff is all the junk in the world, all of our mess, and it gets our attention. And we forget God and his power, that he is the ruler over the kings. We forget it. We forget the power in the name of Jesus. And we're bringing that to the forefront right now. We recalibrate, we reset. Fast forward to today. We need to reset. We need to recalibrate. We need to remember that when we're in the mess, when we are struggling, when we can't see beyond this mess, that God is in control. History is still moving to the destination he sent it towards. Did you hear that? Nothing's going to stop that. Someone wrote this. I want to read this because some of you will really understand this. Unknown, don't know who wrote it, but it's very apropos for this. It's a summary of this Jesus kind of life that he's inviting us to live. Jesus, he is my Lord and he rules my life. I serve him because his bond is love. His burden is light. His goal for me is abundant life. He will never leave me, never forsake me, never mislead me, never forget me. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I'm weak, he is strong. When I'm lost, he is the way. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I'm blind, he leads me. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he's with me. He confronts me in every situation in my life. When I face death, he carries me home. He is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, in every way. He is God. He is faithful. He always was. He always is. He always will be unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. Is that who Jesus is to you and to me? We forget that when we're in the middle of a crisis. When we're fighting stuff and we're just, we just can't get out of it. We can't figure it out. We forget the power of Jesus Christ, who he is, why he came, and the power that he yields. It's ours. We're standing on the rock. So, your health is a mess right now. I have a suggestion. Reset. Look beyond your immediate health to Jesus, who is the ruler of the kings of the world. Remember who he is. And he says, come, follow me. So your mortgage, your rent, your checkbook balance, or lack thereof, feels like a mess right now. I have a suggestion for you. Reset. Look beyond your financial mess to Jesus who says, come, follow me. So your family relationships may be a hot mess right now. Tensions, rebellion, anger, disrespect. Suggestion. Reset. Look beyond your family mess to Jesus who says, Come, follow me. So your heart's desire for this to happen or that to happen, for this to be fixed, for this to be made better, it's a mess right now. A suggestion. Reset. Look beyond whatever mess you have in front of you and look to Jesus who says, Come, follow me. No matter how big your messes are, they aren't bigger than Jesus. So take hope in him. 
look to him, focus on him, and realize that ultimately Jesus wins and we share in the victory. We are victorious because he is victorious. Recognize the real Jesus. That's who he is. Do you believe it? Then you need to live it. You need to reset. That's your priority. That's in front of you, not the junk. Number two, we share in Jesus' victory. To be real with ourselves, we're all broken people. We're a mess. We all know what it is to make mistakes. The Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 8. Um, is that Romans 8.23? Somebody remind me. I just pulled it out of my head. 3.23? We've all messed up. Now, here's the deal. A price, there's a price for our messing up. A price had to be paid for our messing up, for our making our mistakes. Something had to be done. Things that were broken and messed up had to be put right. And the Bible says that Jesus was the one that gave his life in sacrifice so that things could be put right. Jesus, you didn't do it. You didn't take the nails. You didn't get beaten. You didn't take the sin of the world upon yourself. There's only one that could have done it, the Son of God. Sometimes when we're in the middle of our mess and everything feels so wrong, we have just got to remember that Jesus is the one who made it right and is making it right. We just have to hang on to that by faith. Last week, we talked about amazing faith. Amazing faith like the centurion. We see this in Revelation 1.5. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. God has a part and we have a part. God set the price what that price was going to be for salvation and for the forgiveness of sins. That's what God did. Our responsibility is to receive his grace and to to receive that forgiveness. It is done by invitation only. We have to invite him in. We have to accept that gift into our own life. We have to ask for it and receive it. Amen? Some of us, if we're being honest, we believe that God forgives. We believe God loves people. Some of us think that God forgives the person sitting next to us, in the row in front of us, behind us. But the real issue is, do you believe deep down into your own heart that God has forgiven you? Um, In my journey with God, I was 17 years old. When I asked Jesus into my heart, and he forgave me, it gave me great peace. He cleansed me, and I began this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But the way that I'm wired and the way that I think, my family dynamics, I was one of seven children in a family, in a big family. My mother had epilepsy. She could not work outside the home. She could not drive a car. They could not be engaged in our uh, school life or anything like that. We vied for attention. We vied for anything that would take notice, even negative attention. And in some way, I felt, as even as a young child, that I had to earn attention. Did you know that I wet my bed until I was 11 years old every single night? And I think subconsciously, I never went to a counselor for it or anything like that. I kind of grew out of it, thank God, at the age of 11. Ruined a lot of mattresses. Um, But here's the deal. Negative attention got attention. Anything negative. If you did things wrong, you got attention. But I felt in my life that I had to do something to earn attention in a positive way. It was the same in my personal relationship with God. I felt like I had to be good enough. So I tried really, really hard. I tried really hard to earn 
this place with God. Like uh, to a point where I felt like I deserved this forgiveness. And it has taken me years and years and years and years and time in the word and prayer and hearing different messages on receiving God's grace. Maybe you're here today and you just needed to hear that today. You just need to receive God's grace. It's free and it's freeing. It's free. Doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to earn it. You can't earn it. And it's freeing. It's like it takes this 200-pound blanket off of you. And you're free to live the abundant life that God has planned for you. God set the price. God determined what that price was. And God paid the price for you. He determined your value. You're precious to him. If you say God forgives other people, but I'm not sure that he can forgive me, then what you're saying in a roundabout way is that God's going to have to pay more of a price for you. That Jesus wasn't enough. The Bible declares again and again that Jesus is more than enough to pay for your sins and mine and for the whole world. We share in his victories. We are freed by the shedding of his blood. Amen. We are free. Reading in Revelation 1, 5, and 6, it says, All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by the shedding, by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. The term kingdom of priests comes from the book of Exodus in the Old Testament. That's the first time that we see it. The Israelites were being delivered out of slavery and captivity. They were a bunch of ex-slaves who for 400 years had lived in generational slavery in Egypt. We know that story well. But they didn't have an identity. They didn't understand who they were and how they were supposed to live in this new life that God was freeing them into. He calls them out and he declares this amazing statement in the book of Exodus to them. And he says, you are a kingdom of priests. And for these ex-slaves to hear this, it would be almost beyond their understanding. A priest was a high and lofty status and position in the ancient world. Remember, they were in Egypt for 400 years. And now God says, you're my kingdom of priests. Here we see it again all the way through the Bible. And at the end, in the book of Revelation, Jesus now, through John, says again, you are a kingdom of priests. We share in, the, in Jesus' victory, not only forgiveness and, sal- and his salvation that he offers us, but a new identity that we are called to live in, live in and practice. It's not something we shelve and set up like a trophy because we didn't earn it. It was given to us. We're supposed to practice it, live it, be the light to the dark world. Amen? If we're not living it, how are they ever going to see Jesus? We need to live it. You are not the sum total of what everybody else has said about you. Ever been bullied as a kid? Ever been called names as a kid? I still live with the haunting things. I still live with that. But Jesus Christ has defeated them. Even though they come up in my mind, I can take control of those thoughts. They don't, they don't identify me anymore. Amen? Amen. So, you are not the sum total of what everybody else has said about you. You are the sum total of what God says about you. You have a new identity. You are so much more than the worst things that have ever been said about you. Some of you have carried these labels all your life. I'm a bum. I'm a loser. These are things that you've been told. 
I'll never become more than my brother, my sister, my mother, my father. I'll always be this person. I'll never rise above it. I'll always be a slug, a no good, a lousy, sorry excuse for a human being. I know for a fact some of us have been called these things or worse. It's been ingrained into our brains. It's a hard thing to forget. Jesus comes along. Reset. Recalibrate. We have a new identity when we've got a personal relationship with him. It's not the old labels that we carry anymore. We have a new identity. You are loved. You're empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're equipped to serve Jesus Christ and to follow him. You are not who they say you are. You are who God says you are. You are a kingdom of priests. We share in Jesus' victory. Amen? Amen. Jesus says this in Revelation 2.17. He writes to the church in Pergamum. To each of you I will give a white stone. And on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. I have a white stone. You have a white stone. A white stone represents someone who has won a victory. An athlete back then wouldn't want the gold medal. That athlete would want the white stone, the victor. It would have a mark on it that would signify them as the winner, the victor. It would also allow them to pass through other regions, carry some power. It would let them um, go through other regions without a question or an inquiry. It's a golden ticket. We don't have to wait to receive the white stone. We can share in Jesus' victory today because you're not a loser in Christ. You're a winner. And you're not a failure in Christ. You're an overcomer in Christ. You may be a mess. You may be going through a mess right now. But you are done in that mess because Jesus has a hold of you. Say that. Jesus has a hold of me. Jesus has a hold of you. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. Just keep going. Don't stop. Keep going. He's got a hold of you. I picture, remember, remember we talked a couple weeks ago about Peter said, Jesus, when he was walking on the water, Jesus, if you say that I can walk on, if that's you, tell me and I'll walk on water. And he says, come. And he started walking on the water. Then he started looking at the storm, the big waves crashing around him, hearing the wind picking up. And he began to sink immediately. Jesus grabbed. Jesus has a hold of you, no matter what mess you're going through. Share in the victory today in your mess. Step three, look forward to Jesus' return. This is our hope. Sometimes we can't see past the pain that we're in. We can't see past the pain. We kind of feel like every day is an exhausting trial. You're trying to carry the load. Feels like you can't give it any more than you've got right now. And at the end of the day, you're completely spent. You ever feel like that? You go to bed tired, you wake up tired. You toss and turn. You're in torment. Your mind is going 90 miles an hour, and it's going nowhere fast. But it's spinning. You just look around, and you can't see beyond the pain sometimes. Revelation is reminding us to take a step back and realize this is temporary and we are victors with Jesus. He has a hold of us. We have hope of Christ's return. He's coming back for us. He's got us now and he's giving us a hope for the future. I want to read uh, verse 7, Revelation 1. It says, look. Now this is a powerful word. Because it causes you to stop doing what you're doing and refocus. Look at this. Look at this. How many times do little kids, I have grandkids, 
and they're usually around every weekend. And when they call out, they don't stop calling on you until you look at what they're doing, right? Look, 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 mommy, grandma, grandma, whatever. They don't stop until they have your full attention. And it's saying right here, look. In other words, look beyond your pain. Look beyond the weight of what you're carrying. Look beyond the mess. Look beyond the junk. Look. Stop and look. Look. He comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. That's what it says. Revelation directs our attention to say, look to Christ in his second coming. Live with a fervent sense of hope that Christ will return. And when he does, he will make things right in the world. Justice will roll like the river. Wrongs will be made right, and he, we will live with God forever in heaven. We look forward to that hope. I look forward to that hope. Jesus wins. We share in the victory. Recalibrate our thinking because the mess gets pretty messy sometimes and it overtakes us. And you know what? The devil wants it to. The devil wants to distract us. He wants to tear us up. He wants us to get off course with God because if he can do that, he wins. We have to stand our ground and we have to reset. When Jesus first came in the form of a human being, he came as a baby in the manger in Bethlehem. But when he comes again, he's going to be the conquering king. Amen? When he first came, it was quiet dimness. He was born in a stable. He wasn't born in a royal palace. He didn't have guards around him. He had a mom and a dad and stinky smelly animals but when he comes back again everybody's going to see him come when he first came he was the savior of our sins yes and amen to that but when he comes again he's returning the king of kings and the lord of lords at his first coming he was humble and meek and at the second coming he's going to be the conquering warrior and he's doing all of this for us all things will be set right. Jesus wins, and we are in on the win. We are victorious in the middle of our mess. All that matters is your relationship with God and your relationship with other people while we're on this earth. At the end of the day, it's about loving God and loving others. And guess what? Those are the two greatest commandments. When his disciples asked him, what are the two greatest commandments? Aren't they the Ten Commandments? Uh, no, when I came, there's been a little change. Yeah, I've written those on your heart. But the greatest one is this. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. The second one is love your neighbor as yourself. Two greatest commands. Stop making life more complicated than it is. Look to people Look at the people God gave you in your family, in your life, and love them. Don't judge them. Don't put them in a box. Don't put them on a pedestal. Love them the way Jesus loved you. Realize the work that he's doing in our life in this world, even in the midst of elections, the mess that we're in right now. God is calling Christians to be his church, to be a representative of him. I'm going to take just a tiny little sidebar right now because we have an election next week, a week from Tuesday. No matter what the outcome is, no matter how you vote, on the very next day, November 4th, we are representatives of Jesus Christ and we need to live doesn't matter. God knows how the election's going to turn out. We don't. We have a say. We have a vote. But we need to act like representatives of Jesus Christ the day after. 
and forever on. Amen. Jesus is not finished yet. We need to hang on to him in and through our messy life. We need to share in his victory by living in forgiveness, asking for it and giving it, because that's part of making things right. We have a new identity, and Jesus wins. We, um, I want to wrap up with this. Um, last night, we play a lot of games in our house. And we play this, it's a Monopoly card game. It's not the board game, it's with cards. And it is so much fun. In that deck of cards, it's actually like two decks of cards. But in there, there are several cards that trump all of the other cards. And it is a, what's it called, John? Um, Just say no. Just say no. If somebody um, tells you, well, you owe me $5 million, and if in your hand you have that card, you get to play that card that says, Uh Uh-uh, I'm not paying you $5 million. Just say no. And I keep forgetting that I, when I have that card in my hand, it's hidden behind other cards. And I forget the power that that card yields. I say all of this because we have power in our life that we are not drawing upon. His name is Jesus Christ. He is full of glory. He is full of power. He is full of abundant life for us. And we live squallowing right down here in the mud puddle of our problems and our mess. And we have a trump card in our hands and we're not calling on it. We're not using it. His name is Jesus and he has power. He has power over your problems. He has power over your mess. He has power over broken relationships. He has power over cancer. He has power over alcohol. He has power over your money problems. He has power and we don't call on it. So we have to get to know it. We have to read the word. We have to live the word. We have to apply the word. We have to talk about it in our small group. We have to teach it to our children. We have to live it in our marriages. But there's power in the name of Jesus because he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let's start living in the power. And you're gonna watch what God is going to use you for. Watch what he's going to have you say when before you wouldn't say anything because you got the power in you. Let's stop living like we're bound up and shackled and too afraid to say anything. Stand up for what's right and what's going to last because Jesus is coming again and he's coming for his church. Let's be strong. Let's be filled with his spirit and let's get everybody we know in relationship with Jesus. Let's do our part. Father God, thank you that Jesus is a victor because he makes us a victor. Thank you that we are now living. We're resetting, recalibrating. And today we are living for Jesus Christ. And we are only concerned about what God says about us because that's the only label that matters. It's the only label I can take with us when I leave here. Jesus has redeemed me and he paid the price for me. So I'm living, following him. That's how I'm going to live. I'm going to proclaim Jesus Christ. I am going to live him. And if I've done something wrong, church, hold me accountable. We hold each other accountable. But Father God, we need your power in us. So give us a hunger for the word. Help us to do what we know is right. Help us to begin becoming more bold about talking about Jesus with our spouse and our children and our neighbors and our in our workplace. Help us to be the employee of the month every month because we stand for Jesus Christ and morality and ethics and integrity and character. Help us, Father God, be more today than we were yesterday because of what you've done in our life. Thank you that today is a brand new day. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen.